Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. And thanks everybody for coming. It's a great, the mic isn't working. How about now? Ah, I paused for two seconds, but not five seconds, my fatal flaw. In any case, a classic example of a normal accident, the, uh, the, the book that's probably Charles Perrault's best no known book, looking at what happens in, in systems where the c conditions are such that accidents really become the norm. I met Charles uh, on a uh, National Academies Committee studying uh, the issue of dependable software and the risks of society that, that come from our current level of dependability of software. And we, we looked at questions on what's evidence of dependability? What does that mean in the societal context? We need to take things like security into account. Difficult questions and like a lot of these committees, <clears throat> often some contentious discussions Surprisingly, uh, Chick and I were, were usually on the same side of the discussions. Somewhat less surprisingly, we were, we were often in a minority. Um, over the course, I just learned so much about so many things from uh, Chick. For example, he, uh, he gave me a book that he'd written on a early 19th century uh, industrial organization in, the, um, in Massachusetts in the Philadelphia area. And there's amazing things to learn there about the effectiveness of networked organizations, not in today's modern computer age, but back 200 years ago. That's really affected how we've structured a lot of the things with the Ad Astra initiative and the other initiatives that, that we're ramping up around here. Uh, we were very fortunate in being able to, uh, to get a chick to come here to, uh, to give a talk today. His book is not yet out yet, which is why you have the little cards about the next catastrophe rather than the book itself. It's coming out in May, and so I'm sure your appetite will be whetted so much by this talk that you'll all rush right out and get it. With that, a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Charles Perrault. Thank you, John. Um, uh, John and I were in a, in a minority on the on that panel, and I learned more from him than he ever learned from me. Um, first, uh, I would like to say that um, it's nice to be back here. I was born and raised in Tacoma, and um, done a fair bit of sailing on Lake Washington, and so know a little about Seattle. Actually, went to um, University of Washington for one uh, quarter, long, long time ago, before I moved on to more interesting institutions uh, of education. Uh, but uh, today I have a, a very simple message. Uh, disasters from natural sources, from industrial sources, and technological uh, 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 sources, and finally deliberate sources such as terrorism are inevitable. They are inevitable and they are increasing. We can, may prevent some of these um, but, uh, and mitigate some, but we can't escape them. At the present, uh, our um, efforts are focused upon protecting the targets uh, and, uh, or, or reducing the damage to them uh, or the people involved. But we neglect the more basic strategy of reducing the size of the targets. The, uh, that is, um, oh, and I should have um, mentioned that this is an abbreviated summary of uh, this book coming out uh, in May. Um, but we should, could reduce the size of the targets, uh, reduce the concentration of energy found in hazardous uh, materials, the concentration of humans in risky locations, and the concentration of power in vital organizations that sit astride our critical infrastructure. Uh, smaller, dispersed targets for nature's wrath or for industrial accidents or the aim of the terrorist, smaller targets will kill fewer and cause less economic and less social disruption. Now our organizations and our institutions are simply not capable of preventing natural or man-made disasters, nor can we expect them to mitigate their effects very much. 
Here's a list of the types of catastrophes um, that have increased in the last 50 years uh, or so and will continue to mount. Our response has been largely one of prevention, bigger uh, or higher levees on ri rivers, safety alarms installed, border controls and the like, and mitigation such as early warnings, better evacuation, or improving the work of our first responders. But we fall far short of perfection on both prevention and mitigation, and we always will. It's time, I argue, to look at the targets of nature's wrath, industrial failures, or the terrorist jihad. Now, some targets are not reducible, and mitigation is all we can do. Cities will not be abandoned because they sit on earthquake faults, nor can we do much about meteorites, tsunamis, volcanoes, or tornadoes. And the spread of destructive energy from these is so vast, rapid, and often unpredictable that reducing the size of the targets will have very little effect. And with pandemics and bioterrorism, it is just too easy for their deadly organisms to spread for us to do much more than remediation. But these kinds of disasters are rare. Most of our disasters are more frequent. Hurricanes, floods, explosions, fires, or as with a terrorist attack on large targets or the internet, are anticipated in the near future. At present, we are doing little about these that is effective. Take our response to the 9-11 tragedy. It represents the political and organizational problems that we face as a nation. Our Homeland Security Department, represented here, got off to a poor start and has largely fumbled since then. Congress would not give up any of the fiscal and personnel power of the 88 committees and subcommittees that oversaw the 22 agencies that were forced together into one department. That this here is a sanitized scheme of um, that department. This is much more like it. Around the border, are the committees and the subcommittees that oversee the Department of Homeland Security and feed at the trough of the billions of dollars we have dumped into that organization. Um, around, uh, Tom Ridge and his top aides testified on average every day and a half in the first year of its operation and the department gave 1,300 briefings to Congress in the first year of its operation. Congress has been in there with all its tooth and claws, and the pork has been tremendous. Senators from small states ensured that a traditional forma, formula was used so that 40% of the money had to be divided equally among the states, regardless of threats or even the population size. Those New York City had been the target for six terrorist attacks in the last decade before 9-11. Um, the state as a whole, New York State, received only $25 per person as compared to Wyoming's $61 per person. When the White House tried to change the formula to reflect the risk, Senator Lay of Vermont pointed out that the majority of the senators on his committee that would have to approve of the change came from small states like his of Vermont, which got $54. So the change was never made. The small states continue to get a disproportionate amount. Big chunks of port security money went to private firms for refurbishing their facilities, often in inland states and resort areas that face no security risk. We spent a lot of money on the ports in the Caribbean um, uh, resort areas. When first responders' fi funds finally began flowing, it took three years, uh, they had to be spent on equipment, which benefits business, but not on personnel, where it was really needed. The benefits for business got so bad that the first inspector general of the department went public with some of it. 
including what he called a $10 million theft by Boeing, and he was fired. Tests of readiness have showed woeful performances. Parked police officials in Washington, D.C. to test readiness and their new scheme uh, deliberately left a suitcase next to the Washington Monument. They waited, but no pol policeman appeared. Later, it was determined that the responsible policeman was sleeping instead of patrolling. With no police response, they called DHS and got this recording from our protectors. Due to the high level of interest in the new department, all of our lines are busy. However, your call is important to us, and we encourage you to call back soon. The company that hires most of the guards for our nuclear plants also to test their security. So to get high ratings, they rigged the tests so that everyone knows just what kind of a mock attack is going to occur and when it will be. For some months, it was hard to be sure that the airport security personnel even plugged in the scanning machines they were supposed to be watching. T teams testing security are able to steal plutonium from government nuclear defense sites. These are red teams that they send in to see if the security works. Sneak weapons, they've been red teams of snuck weapons ab aboard uh, airplanes. They hide mock bombs in containers that are selected for inspection and then not detected by the inspection system, just testing it out. And a newspaper, uh, I think it was, or no, uh, um, uh, it wasn't CNN, but something like that, was able to bring radioactive material that could be used for dirt, dirty bombs over the Canadian border without being detected. They did that twice, six months apart. First time they did it, oh, we're going to clean it up. They tried again six months later, and they still were not detected. The failures that we know of of the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA, and especially uh, uh, in connection with Katrina, are endless. Now, the most vigorous effort of the White House in connection with the formation of the new department was largely successful. It was an attempt to deunionize personnel in the agencies that would be moved. But one doubts that this effort would contribute to our security. Now, as an organizational theorist, I'm not surprised at these failings. As we theorists say, organizations are permanently failing, both public organizations and private ones. So let's not depend upon unreasonably efficient organizations or impossibly effective government. I think the Clinton administration just might have prevented 9-11. It twice alerted airports, police, and border controls when attacks upon the U.S. were threatened in 1998 and in 1999, and FEMA was a model agency under the Clinton administration. But the Bush administration, as bad as it has been in the disaster area, is not the main reason for our woes. Under the best of government, our organizations are bound to fail. So let's do something about the targets. Take nature's targets. From 1950 to 1999, the annual number of natural disasters declared major by the U.S. government has increased about four times, and most are weather-related. And that's a long period. That's uh, 50 years. The weather had not much changed in, in that 50 years, but the number of people and their dwellings and their workplaces and their toys in risky areas had gone up. Disasters now take fewer lives because of better warning and evacuation systems and better emergency medical care but the economic costs of the disasters and over those 50 years did not increase just four times as the disaster rate did, but 14 times. They cost us now about 54 billion a year, or did before Katrina. Unfortunately, they are subsidized by federal insurance policies and disaster relief, both of which encourage people to build unsafe structures 
in warm, lovely, hurricane-washed coast with waterfront views, and in lovely California coasts and hillsides vulnerable to floods, fires, mudslides, and earthquakes. Now, New Orleans is or was a gem, but it's a soup bowl, 10 feet below the levees. Here it is again. The Red Cross estimated the death toll in New Orleans from a force four hurricane. This was before uh, Katrina. Uh, filling the soup bowl would range from 70,000 to 150,000. That worst case did not happen because the levees were not suddenly topped by a surge where there would be no time for people to climb from their first floor to the attic and break through under the roof and be saved. But they, the levees crumbled slowly in just a few places, and it took a long time to fill the soup bowl. And they crumbled because of the inadequacies of an organization, the inadequate construction supervised by the Army Corps of Engineers. So why wait for nature to deconcentrate these people and to kill 1,800 uh, um, people in the process? Withdraw the federal subsidies for insurance and announce that disaster relief will not be provided when laws regarding this are violated, when you live in a place you shouldn't live in. New Orleans could serve its important economic role as the largest port in the nation at one-third of its size, and at one-third of its size, it could be protected. Or take industrial disasters. Chemical plants sit, sit next to apartment houses, as in this case, and their toxic products can leak into sewage city sewers, as this one did in Louisville, Kentucky, destroying four city blocks, which took over two years to rebuild. Our chemical industry is highly concentrated, and that concentrates the hazardous materials. Here is a disaster that filled 1,800 homes with oil, render, rendering them complete total losses because of the concentrated storage in a populated area of New Orleans. The tanks were simply not properly secured. They should have been filled with water when a storm is coming along, and they were not so they spilled. Now even more oil spilled from these tanks but they were not in a residential area and so nobody was hurt. There are 123 locations in our nation where a vapor cloud released by an accident or a terrorist attack could endanger over 1 million people. 123 places of 1 million people each over one million. The economic advantage of these scale economies are small compared to the risks they pose to people. The government should mandate the use of safer substances and smaller, more dispersed storage, storage facilities and prohibit large storage in urban areas. We were very lucky with the World Trade Center, oddly enough. There were huge quantities of diesel fuel in the basements that came very close to ignition, which would have made the devastation far worse if those tons of fuel had burned. Fuel could be brought in a little at a time, as it's needed. The economies of large storage in the midst of millions of people are tiny, and the risk they run is very large. In the chemical industry, the larger the plant and the larger the firm, the greater the toxic releases, according to government data. Big is not safer, nor is big easier to regulate. Concentration in the railroad industry is associated with an increase in accidents, some involving toxic substances in populated areas. Concentration in the electric power industry, following the deregulation of the industry in the 1990s, can be tied to the giant northeast blackout of 2003, and certainly to the power shortages and huge cost increase that California, Oregon, Vancouver, and your state of Washington experienced in 2001 and 2002. 
we are simply eating away at our critical infrastructure in these cases of concentration and presenting larger targets for storms, industrial accidents, and terrorists. A final industrial concentration is less obvious and more controversial. A key part of our critical in infrastructure is now the Internet. At present, the net is highly deconcentrated. It's the world's largest system, and it is extremely deconcentrated. But forces are end endangering that deconcentration, and this will reduce its security. In addition, with only one operating system on 95% of desktop computers, Microsoft Windows has, had not, has not had to pay much attention to reliability or security in the past. For a few years, this was not much of a problem because Windows was used as a standalone facility in a home or an office or bank or a company, company workstation. But once the internet took off and everything became interconnected and the unreliability of a workstation in a bank now connected to vast financial markets spread as did the consequences of security breaches. Software failures are responsible for very few deaths to date but increasingly software is linked to systems with catastrophic potential in the case of, of uh, failures or terrorist attacks. Of course, most software failures in our critical infrastructure are not due to Microsoft. Um, but uh, no accounting has been made of their corporate source. But with only 10% of the software market, which Microsoft has, dwarfed by SAP and IBM's CDIC, it would appear to be a small player in the huge software industry. That's true. But the Windows operating system is so ubiquitous that over half of SAP's customers use it with Microsoft products such as Windows. And it can bring any unreliability or lack of security into these systems. Windows-based software plays a critical role in our financial structure, our nuclear power plants, industry control systems, SCADA systems, defense department data banks, the FBI, the CIA, military weapons, and fighting platforms such as aircraft, tanks, and ships. We now have something called Windows for Warships. Uh, and. Um, and appears to be used to some extent, at least to some extent, in most everything else that can kill. Heart pumps, infusion pumps, pacemakers, medication distributions in hospitals, and now the safety of our most widely used weapon, the automobile. A good part of the problem with software uh, reliability stems then from the success and thus the concentrated power of Microsoft. It is embedded in all of our critical infrastructures. Now it's improving the, its reliability and security, to be sure, I believe that. But if you believe in capitalism, we need a market, several viable operating systems that can compete freely. And, um, that will uh, compete on the basis of reliability and security where lives and economic da uh, damage are at stake. Concentration in the telecommunications industry is now occurring in the previously highly deconcentrated area of the internet servers that is the backbone of the net. Not only will our freedom to serve be restricted, but with server concentration the targets for hackers, thieves, or terrorists are much larger and thus more consequential. And fi firewalls are harder co to construct with such concentration, so there's a disaster component to here. Recently, the U.S. State Inter Inter Interstate Commerce Com Commission ruled that cable internet, internet access is an information service rather than as telecommunications and thus exempted it from the requirements 
for telecommunication companies to act as common character carriers. This allowed the increased concentration. This is something that happened by virtue of law. So what can be done about reducing vulnerabilities that come from economic concentration? These are the tools that we would have for coping with this. This is what we have to attend to. But there are at least two major problems with this. The first is the political will. But let me point out that in every case I have mentioned here of vulnerabilities, we have had in the past laws and regulations that address these issues. But these laws and regulations have been dropped, weakened, or are not enforced. Take a trivial example. The government tried, has tried to withhold disaster relief from those who failed to take out subsidized insurance or failed to conform to regulations. <clears throat> but it had to back off when the flood or the hurricane actually came. Congress forced it to change. This could be corrected. More important, we have precedents for reducing or preventing concentrated economic power and thus for deconcentrating organizations. Thirty years ago, we had effective antitrust legislation. It could be reinstated. A federal judge tried to break up Microsoft uh, with, which I believe, a very faulty proposal in, in my view. Uh, but we could try again and break it up and get more comp competition among uh, operating systems. There's a lot of concentration out there that I'm, I'm not particularly worried about. Take the trivial case of uh, Intuit's uh, Qu Quicken. The Department of Justice moved in quickly on that and forestalled a Microsoft takeover of the highly successful company. Uh, I'm not worried about personal computers running um, uh, accountancy programs. I'm worrying about computers that run nuclear power plants and airplanes and things like that. Um, now, the government could be much more effective if, like the state of Massachusetts, it required open source operating systems. Massachusetts passed a law. In the future, all operating systems have to be open source. And if Microsoft doesn't manage, doesn't want to make itself open source, it's not going to be used in, that, in Massachusetts for government agencies. We could once again regulate the internet as a common carrier, allowing free access which would limit concentration. That's one problem. The second problem with reducing economic concentration is the argument for e economies of scale. Big organizations are more efficient, it is argued. But the scales, the, the uh, scales that we have now in the vulnerable parts of our critical infrastructure are well beyond any reasonable sizes. They're huge. Well beyond any needs for production efficiencies. The large sales sizes that we have are there to achieve market control and political influence, not production efficiencies. For example, most processes involving hazardous materials would still be productively efficient at greatly reduced scales, and this would concentrate fewer hazardous materials. Now, we're bound to have large systems in our highly interconnected nation, but we do not necessarily need them to be dominated by large organizations. The difference between systems and organizations. A system made up of many rather than a few organizations, is more resilient and has more redundancy. While we think of our nation and its economy as highly interdependent, most of the relationships in that economy are ones of dependency, and many lack safeguards of redundancy. A city in a risky area needs multiple redundant evacuation routes and multiple redundant means of protection medical and other emergency services. If we rely upon only a few, the inevitable failure of some of these is going to put us in peril. 
It is similar with our crucial electric power system in the U.S. We had more reliability before deregulation allowed the concentration of power and producers. The Internet has been incredibly reliable be because it is designed to have multiple redundant pathways between the billions of nodes. This reliability is now threatened as Internet service providers are consolidating, making them more vulnerable to accidents, hackers, and terrorists, as well as threatening our freedom of access. The urge to consolidate and concentrate critical functions in the large organizations simply increases our vulnerability as a nation. We can have large systems, and must have, without large organizations dominating them. The electric power grid and the Internet, now in danger, were good examples of deconcentrated large systems. There are two other systems that are very large and very deconcentrated, which I want to spend just a moment on. Um, these are networks of small firms and, alas, terrorist networks. They should be models for us. Uh, though the four systems, the power grids, the internet, and uh, small firm networks, and the terrorist networks, are highly interconnected, the relationships between the nodes of these networks are predominantly ones of interdependability. That is, it involves reciprocity rather than dependencies, that is, authority relationships. Most of our critical infrastructure could be configured this way. Reciprocal relations involve self-adjusting devices and the possibility of self-organization. Increasingly, the reliability of the power grid depends upon so-called intelligent agents, relays and circuit breakers that read incoming signals and make adjustments automatically and send signals for other nodes to make adjustments. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. government does not demand the investment in this, these kind of de devices by our highly profitable electric power industry, but it could, and we could have more self-organization uh, there. Um, the Internet has electronic agents that search for the best link between nodes, as you know, and this is an example of this. The reciprocity in networks of small firms is more prosaic uh, than electronic, but offers more lessons for organizations in our critical infrastructure. These small firms' networks exist in northern Italy, Scandinavian countries, Japan machine tool industry, and other industries in Japan, some parts of Silicon Valley, and the networks of biotech firms in the U.S. Small firms, incidentally, by themselves are not a virtue. If they're not networked among themselves, a whole bunch of small firms, then they, they present classic examples of dependency, either upon a large firm they serve or a dependency upon a very local market. But small firms that are networked are a different phenomenon. The reciprocity in networks of small firms involves sharing of information sharing technologies, market opportunities, in the interest of the common good of the whole industry, even when individual firms compete fiercely. Knowledge is shared as employees move between firms, as the prospects of the individual firms rise and fall. You can change your job without changing your carpool. The firms in an industry, machine tools, textiles, consumer goods, packaging machines, and so forth, uh, of these small firm networks support trade schools and transportation and uh, other infrastructure um, facilities. The communities where they are located are more prosperous and liberal than the communities where, that are dominated by big firms. No single firm dominates them. Unfortunately, these structures are being challenged by mass marketers and concentrated producers in the global economy. But they still exist out there, and there could be a model for our critical infrastructure. Terrorist networks, very brief, have extensive ties between the cells, sharing information and expertise and people moving between them freely. A study that a friend of mine did of the Madrid railroad train bombing disclosed dozens of cells in a variety of nations that cooperated in the endeavor, and taking out any one single cell 
would have little effect upon this very resilient network. If you take out Microsoft, you're going to have quite an effect upon our network. But if we had many Microsofts, taking one of them out would not make much difference. Summarizing these four examples of size, reliability, efficiency, and, and their organizational control structure offers an instructive alternative to system divide, design uh, to those in the U.S. upon which we depend for our protection for our three disaster sources. Um, the, um, just to run through these, the Internet, the largest organization in the world, Power Grid, the largest machine in the U.S., uh, terrorist networks vary from uh, uh, size and in, in size of 10 to the, the hundreds, maybe even the thousands. Um, system reliability in, is very high in the internet, pretty high in the power grid. It's a little more difficult in small firm networks, and uh, um, but it's self-adjusting. And the terrorist networks, it's incredible how reliable they are, given the fact that they are under continuous threat and attack. Uh, efficiencies are high in all of these. The terrorists, for example, low maintenance costs, low operating costs. A cell is wiped out, it doesn't, doesn't mean a thing, it doesn't cost them. Very efficient kind of systems are small ones, much more than big concentrated systems. And finally, the control. At the top, it's not authority relationships, not control. It's coordination and uh, goal setting, coordination and monitoring, not command and control. Second level, these, are, these huge organizations often have only a, really four levels of, um, of control as, as organizational theories, theorists conceptualize control instead of 14 or 20. Um, so the second level is concerned with product dev devolution, spatial devolution. Third is the support staff. And the biggest, biggest thing, these are structures that are like this, uh, has uh, uh, the lowest level is high autonomy and are self-adjusting. Um, in contrast to these four, uh, most organizations are critical structure, centralized, bureaucratic, difficult change, and the commercial ones seek to maximize profit through market control and, incidentally, charge higher prices to consumers. Um, as we did, uh, the, uh, even if you control for fuel costs, electric power rates have gone up significantly since deregulation, uh, and they were supposed to go down. Um, in the matter of concentration of hazardous materials that are vulnerable to our three sources of disasters, it's clear that large firms concentrate more hazmats, and research shows that large firms in the chemical and oil sector have more accidents and pollute more than smaller firms. Big is not safer. So legislation regarding liability is another thing that we need. Damage from chemical disasters are not charged to the companies, but absorbed by the communities. Fines for violating uh, regulations, federal re regulations, are just very trivial. They don't even bother with them. With realistic liability claims, however, there could be a strong incentive to deconcentrate storage of hazmats, deconcentrate populations, and use safer materials and processes even without any antitrust legislation. Unfortunately, the U.S. is not at present in a place to encourage this. Lacking campaign financing controls, Congress is beholden to the large donors, and that's mainly big business. And so is the presidency, which, with Congress, shapes our, the judicial system, and that, that system increasingly favors private interests <coughs> And rules, and, and rules, for example, that states cannot pass environmental laws that are stronger than the federal ones. And the federal ones are withering and were weak in the first place. The, the U.S. federal, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the federal laws preempt the state laws, and when they're higher, forget it. 
The, the mass media is controlled by a small number of huge for-profit corporations, so hopes for a concerned, informed electorate on these matters are dimmer by the year. To conclude, when I studied networks of small firms some 50 years, 15 years ago, I had the only nocturnal emission I have had in connection with capitalism. Here was the alternative to the multi-divisional firm. Small firm networks more likely to represent community rather than self-interest. But the high, hard wiring of our instincts as a result of thousands and thousands of years of evolutionary adaptation presents a constant threat to the idea of community rather than the idea of self-interest. Both community and self-interest are in our makeup. They are both in there, hardwired, so to speak. Uh, but particularly with the growing abundance and prosperity since World War II, community seems less urgent and self-interest gets a big, bigger play. It is very seductive, but it must be restrained in view of the increasing threat of major disasters. Our, at present, we are no better than the Department of Homeland Security and can only keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much. A couple, a couple of uh, references I wanted to give. Uh, not sure how many people saw Bill McKibben's talk this Wednesday. Is that up on ResNet? Oh, good. He's should be, should be, yeah. yeah, it's a, it, it's um, struck some very complimentary notes uh, in in a in a very in I'd say a complimentarily positive focus, looking at the opportunities we have to deepen community as we move to um, more decentralized economic structures. He focused a lot on the agricultural area where we see a lot of these same effects and then on climate change in general and had some hopeful uh, thoughts about using social networks and the internet to, uh, to get around the concentration in the mass media. The Starfish and the Spider talk from gosh, about six months ago on ResNet, also explores decentralized organizational structures with some consideration similarly of the terrorist networks. Uh, the security is an area where I don't completely agree with, with Chick. I think the, the data is ambiguous. You can make some very strong cases that um, given Microsoft's rate of improvement in security and the, and the, the trailing of some other competitors like, like Apple, that a relatively small concentration of vulnerable machines may be enough to bring the internet down. To the extent that you believe that, there's arguments in, in both directions. I, I, I tend to view this still as an open, open question. I mean, it's interesting that uh, Apple annoyed a bunch of security researchers. There's great stuff in the bloggers feel about, about that, and they focused on Apple. This month's Apple security patch had 48 security bug fixes. I mean, those are levels that we haven't seen for a long time at Microsoft. Um, still, I think, I think it's a very valid question, and I do think it's a good question as to what, what effect open source would have on this. In terms of Microsoft, you know, I really believe that if we act in a decentralized way and can internally radically decentralize the power, then we can get a lot of these same economies, the same uh, both resiliency and efficiency aspects of the networks of small firms, if we can set up our organizations to do that. I think a real key was what, uh, what Chick said about the, uh, the networked reciprocity effects. People at Microsoft don't in general understand this reciprocity, this win-win this notion. I was once in a presentation with Steve Ballmer where I sort of stated as a postulate, well, we don't understand this. And he said, well, yes, we do. And, and we looked at each other blankly because we had no way to uh, explore this difference of, of opinion. My experience is that most groups here don't understand that. So to the extent that we want to reap these kinds of advantages internally, this is clearly a direction we need to go. And when I talk about how you know, we relate this back to our organizational thinking at Microsoft, where uh, to remind everybody our stated corporate policy is not to, uh, to favor uh, breaking up the company in case there's any confusion about that. Um, I think there's still a lot to apply. And like I said, this really has, has impacted how we're doing our grassroots work. So. Um, thanks much. And with that, questions? Yes. Me? Uh, no, the, the gentleman behind you had his hand up first. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for bringing a perspective to Microsoft that I think may be um, 
you know, not especially popular to hear here. It's, uh, you know, well, I don't agree with you. Uh, I at least like hearing um, perspectives yeah. that are not the myopic focus we sometimes have. Um, I had a question for you about government regulation because you presented that as a, a solution um, to decentralization um, <coughs> potentially. And the electric grid is a particular example that you brought up where you believe that regulation could be beneficial. Um, as you may know, we had uh, over Hanukkah a really terrible storm in Seattle that knocked out uh, power to pretty much the majority of the Puget Sound area, in some cases like mine, for um, several days. And one of the key reasons um, that came out afterwards in the postmortems uh, that, that this occurred is uh, we have a lot of, you know, we need large trees, as I'm sure you've noticed driving here. Um, and there are government regulations that prohibit cutting trees even when they're unsafely near power lines. Uh, Mercer Island in particular was, uh, was an area where this happened and they were out for you know, pretty much the longest in, in the entire Puget Sound area. So can you speak to that? Uh, because I, I think that you, know, you, you, you may have a point that regulation serves a purpose, but I'm kind of wondering how you balance that with regulation being done in a smart way, which sometimes government doesn't do. That's, you, you just answered your own question. You have to do it in a smart way. There's a lot of regu there's There are regulations that are stupid, that uh, grew up under different circumstances, were never changed or never removed. Uh, and uh, that's a problem that goes on continuously. And that, that kind of a problem we can solve. We can solve that through democratic government and uh, um, good officials and so forth. Um, it shouldn't be too hard to look at the, the power line and tree problem in, um, in the Pacific Northwest. What is it hard now? a serious um, consequence of it, just like it's not hard to look at levees in New Orleans having had a serious consequence of neglect of their maintenance. But, oh, no. Um, you know, the, that, the, I think that's different. Uh, those levees were not built to standards. Um, the, 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 the people that were, this interested me because normally I think that contractors or subcontractors are just out to gouge. But in the case of New Orleans levees, the contractors said, hey, um, 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 the um, um, government bureau, um, uh, you, your specifications here are very dangerous. You're filling in this, this with the wrong kind of sand. It's not going to hold. It's going to be a waste. And the the um, um, uh, the bureau, uh, Army Corps of Engineers, went ahead, insisted on it uh, that it go forward. That didn't come out for a long time. It's not in my book uh, because that just come out since uh, the text was finished. Uh, but that uh, there was opposition from the contractors. They were putting in something that was bad. Now that's that's not a government. That's that's deregulating government is not going to remove that kind of problem. We need tighter regulations. The Army Corps of Engineers, I think, and uh, as with the electric power, but. Uh, uh, re deregulating the industry meant that the industry no longer had to invest in uh, the, the power transmission lines. And so the investment in the grid declined rapidly because there was no incentive for the organizations. Deregulation brought about that. Before that, there was some strong incentives for power companies to invest in transmission. So that's the kind of difference I'm talking about. This this person objects, so yes, sir. No, I don't object. Uh, um, my list of two questions has grown to three. Um, the first one, an observation of one of the other problems we had when we had this big storm, is that thanks to deregulation, the power company's been allowed to externalize the cost of outages onto all of its customers with absolutely no penalty to itself. Um, and one of the things they did, of course, was they fired two-thirds of their maintenance crew and seven-eighths of their emergency crew. And well, I'm not particularly a 
fan of regulation, it seems to me that there is an alternative here and that basically organizations have to show responsibility instead of being statutorily exempt from it. Li and liability insurance could uh, uh, do something in that area. Yeah. Now, that's, that, now, the question I have is, well, two of them, really. The first one is government regulation in the U.S. has a really bad tendency to be addressing special interests instead of the public welfare. Uh, how do you plan to address that? The other question is, which is something that I have some personal experience with, is what do you, how do you view, if you study the breakup and demise of the Bell system, and how do you view the effect it's had on the telecommunications industry? Well, the Bell system is a, a wonderful example. Um, it should have been broken up, and the effect of it was very positive because Carter Phone but then was able to move ahead with uh, um, innovations that uh, AT&T had no interest being the sole provider um, uh, in uh, providing. And I don't know that the breakup was particularly the wisest one, but at least it was a step. But what's happened now, uh, the breakup is over. They're all coming back together. They're all being, all the bell systems are con coming under control and we're now very close to where we were before the breakup started. No? We're not even close because there's no Bell Labs now. Sorry? We're not even close because there's no Bell Labs now. Uh, okay, that's a, that's a different uh, different issue. Um, um, no, but, but, years. Well, it was not. It, it, is, it is part of the same issue. Uh, yeah, I would like to ask, okay. where would the transistor have come from? If where would MP3 have come from? Decentralized research infrastructure. S sorry, I couldn't hear you. Where would the transistor have come from without Bell Labs, and how would uh, how would man have gotten to the moon without the government? And where would Bell Labs? Centralization. You you didn't address the flip side, which is what are the benefits of centralization? And there are some amazing benefits that I didn't hear, you know, one iota about. So I'd, I'd love to hear about some of the benefits because All right. I, I found I found. Your discussion very enlightening, but rather one-sided. Okay, let's let's uh, let's run through a, a bit of that um, scenario first. Uh, the transistor came from government um, funds, so government subsidies of, of, of Bell Lab. Once it started, uh, no, uh, uh, I think both the internet and the research on the transistor were government funded. Through yeah. the I mean, Bell I, think, I think this is an area where there are two uh, two different histories. There's the Bell-focused history, which has everything pivoting on Bell Labs, and then there's a larger history, which has things pivoting on the government funding. So may I suggest that we don't spend our time arguing about those two different no, viewpoints? I, about that uh, no. one. I, I would just like to hear what are some of the benefits yeah. of uh, Okay, th th then, the, then the issue is, do, do uh, networks of, let me pose the issue in an um, uneven-handed way. Uh, do the do uh, small firm networks generate more innovations than large firms? Sometimes they do, and sometimes large firms do better. It depends upon um, a, a lot of issues, capital structure, and so forth. But uh, in um, the area of biotech, they're all coming from uh, small firms with government funding uh, through the universities and through the national. Uh, national labs. Uh, so what you need is a, a, a structure where you have the resources which can come from a variety of places, from uh, uh, small um, uh, venture capital firms, from the government, or from Hewlett -Pack Packard, which is responsible for zillions of, of innovation coming out of a very large firm, or uh, uh, so it can come from a variety of surfaces. But let's take a look at Hewlett Packard. One of the reasons why it was so successful, why we have the um, uh, Silicon Valley being so successful, that is innovation, as soon as innovations popped up within that firm, they went out. And uh, those people left the firm with Hewlett Packard's uh, um, um, uh, agreement, and beneficence, and even funding, went out and started their own small firms. Because Hewlett Packard, like uh, Xerox, realized that when you tie the reward, uh, the incentive to the activity that you can with small firms, 
so that you get the returns from it instead of the big corporation. You're going to get more of this turmoil of innovation. But it's the centralization, like Richard Florida would say, you need the centralization of the intellectuals and the money in one place. And it, so it seems like there's a... John, Actually, that, that, absolutely. Part of Richard Florida's argument. I agree John, with you. John, can I, yeah. you know, can, can I have my say without you popping up and answering? Thank you. I mean, my understanding is that the centralization uh, that his argument is is that that this this brings to, you you need the centralization to have this effect of being able to spawn off spawn off these entities. Nope. So there's some amount of centralization that seems to be necessary. No, no? there isn't. No, you can have uh, most of the small firm networks came without any centralization. Uh, their their history is is very interesting. They started up as kind of leftovers from industrial processes. And uh, they started out with small firms and uh, with very little capital and grew. And this, this happened in um, uh, northern Italy, in Japan, and the Scandinavian countries. And to, to a certain extent, it happened in Silicon Valley with um, um, those innovations. So you can have them grow without centralization. I would strongly uh, disagree with you that you need centralized systems to grow innovation. But let's, uh, th th I hope there are some other areas that we can cover. Yes? I'd like to go back to regulation for a second. You seem to be uh, very pro-government uh, regulation of big companies and organizations, centralized organizations. Right. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, one of the problems I see is that government itself is a centralized organization, and so you're asking, you're, you are giving power to a centralized organization, and I thought the point was to spread everything out as much as possible. How can you put those two together? Yeah, that's that's um, that's the uh, tough uh, uh, conceptually because of the way we we think about these problems. When I talk about government regulation, I'm talking about regulation and not control. And you can regulate without having a centralized government, without having a huge government and a lot of of um, uh, aspects to it. Um, the, uh, the, the impact of a Supreme Court decision about whose standards will prevail in the case of risky systems um, just is enormous. It just takes out the possibility of states doing their own regulation. And that has nothing to do with the size of government or whether government is that centralized or not. That deals with the Supreme Court decision. Um, and um, I can go down the line, how did, why do we have those Supreme Court decisions and, you know, who appoints the courts, the presidency, uh, who elects them, who's the, the big uh, influence in, in that, back to, uh, to uh, corporate, uh, to large corporations. So big government well, or here's another way of expressing it. Um, we have much, much bigger government now than we realize because we have outsourced so much of it. But it's, and it would be much more efficient if we're insourced. Uh, our military would be much larger if we were, didn't have Blackwater and 16 other uh, such uh, organizations doing military affairs, shooting people, in, in uh, Iraq. Uh, so let us count it truly, and then our government will be, uh, be seen as, as bigger, but it will be more responsive, because Blackwater is not responsive. It's not liable for, for any of this. As a matter of fact, it, it's very expensive. We train uh, special forces troops uh, uh, for years uh, at the public expense, and as soon as they can, they join Blackwater for 10 times the salary. Blackwater sits there and we'll, we'll pay you 10 times as much. So what the hell? They leave that. We train them. They go to Blackwater, water, and now it costs us 10 times as much to protect an ambassador when he lands in Baghdad. Uh, because ba Blackwater is doing it with these high salaries. Um, that's, that's another issue. You know, there's just one thing that John brought up, and uh, which I would like to, um, because it, it might not come up again, come back to, and see if I can get any uh, uh, argument on this. Um, 
there's more to it than, than just breaking up uh, uh, Microsoft, though I still think that we need more companies competing than, rather than, than one, uh, especially in a platform, in a system that uh, uh, is tied to so many other systems in our critical infrastructure. Um, and that's how you go about building, designing and building your product. And one of the most encouraging things I've heard about Microsoft um, in, the, in the last year was associated with the, uh, I think, with the appointment of Ray Ozzy um, to um, run the, the company, bringing his company in. And uh, Ozzy's statements about op open source and especially about modularization. And I have a very primitive understanding of these kinds of things because I don't count uh, uh, or I don't count very well and uh, I don't program. Uh, I got as far in um, the early 80s with some inline uh, programming in order to, to, to write a book that I was working on but uh, dropped it then, it was too hard for me. Uh, so I'm not very good about this but my understanding is that Microsoft has integrated its applications into its kernel, into its core program, and thus uh, uh, tied them together in a way that makes it harder to test and harder to change and makes it impossible for anybody to come in with a, a similar application and tie into it or makes it very difficult. But that now Microsoft is moving more towards modularization so that when you abandon Longhorn um, and uh, those six years of, of uh, incredible amount of work started over, uh, you didn't start completely over, of course, but uh, started over, you started looking at building modules which can be construct constructed and tested separately and then uh, added to the kernel and applied. This makes you less competitive because another company can build a similar module, module and tap into yours and so you, you won't get the revenue from Internet Explorer uh, if uh, somebody else can uh, uh, come in with a Mozilla or something like that. Uh, but it does seem to me to make the system more reliable uh, and, and safer uh, uh, and uh, uh, more secure. Two things I'm concerned about. Reliability and security where critical infrastructure is involved. Does this make sense? Have I got this at all right? Sort of. Um, sort of. Well, yes. the one thing to look at in embedded systems is there's Windows does run some embedded systems, and when you were talking about SCADA applications in particular, that's, um, you know, that's an area that's uh, sort of new. What kind of applications? SCADA. You call it SCADA. SCADA. Uh, SCADA. Yeah, SCADA. 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 Coast yes, I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I got out. I got out of the Pacific Northwest at age 18. So. Oh, you did. Okay. Well, uh, the uh, a lot of those systems still run, believe it or not, DOS. And one of the uh, largest players in that space is called Wind River, and they have their own operating system that's sort of kind of like an extension of DOS. And you probably remember DOS from back in the sure, days. yeah. Um, so there's still a ton of that out there, and these systems are, you know, generally not networked, or if they're networked, they're done in very primitive ways, uh -huh. um, you know, often using just, you know, serial communications, right? Um, never, never anything outside of the site. So I was a bit perplexed at your criticism of, um, of the homogeneity of, of Microsoft operating systems, because in where it comes down to critical infrastructure, we actually have a great deal of competition in embedded systems, and we aren't the biggest player. Um, another uh, another point is that when you look at Windows operating that's systems... A, that's important. When it comes down to critical systems, you're not the biggest player, and there's a lot of competition. G when, me, when you're talking about specifically SCADA applications and embedded SCADA? systems, we are not the largest uh, player. Yeah. Um, and I believe that Wind River is still a larger, has a bigger piece of Wind, Wind River? Wind River systems. They're out of Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. See? Um, Good. So another, uh, another question I had is you held up the Internet as a shining pillar of, um, of decentralization. And 
but at the same time, um, we're concerned that a large percentage of the uh, machines on the internet are running Windows. And again, that's not true. The root servers, which is the most vulnerable piece of internet infrastructure, is run by a company called Verisign. Yeah. Run on a non-Microsoft operating system. Yeah. They run on an Unix. open source operating system called uh, BSD. I believe they're running on free BSD. Yeah. Yeah. And all 50% roughly of the market um, for internet servers is not Microsoft. Um, we came from zero. Um, and we were barely above that when I started here seven years ago. And you know we've gone to 50%, which I think is a pretty incredible yeah. accomplishment. But there's, you know, when you're talking about the big, the large systems that store critical databases and critical systems, um, you have, you know, we don't have even half the market in a lot of those cases. And you know, particularly with databases, um, you know, IBM and Oracle are huge competitors. So, is that why it's it's, it's as secure as it is and reliable as it is? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, if you look at the root servers, if you had a vulnerability in the operating system that they ran and somebody found a way to get in there, they're all running the same operating system. So this is, so effectively, you have the same vulnerabilities in the internet as an infrastructure as, um, as you would in 95% of clients. In fact, you'd have a greater vulnerability because it's 100% with one operating system in the case of the root servers that do DNS. Um, and if you, if you view the operating system as a vulnerability, personally, I don't, because when you're looking at large-scale systems, the operating system is one component of your overall security model. And if you go talk to VeriSign about how they protect the root servers, there's many, many, many layers of security that they have on top of the operating system and the software that they run that help protect that overall system. Still, they were hacked. In 2003, they weren't. Yeah. They were hacked. Anybody could be hacked. And and you know also part of the infrastructure would be the routers. Yeah, yeah. and that's heavily. Well, the biggest piece is heavily fiber. involved in Cisco. If you want to get out of Seattle, you have three ways of doing it. One is one fiber strand that runs east. One is one fiber strand that runs south. And one's a satellite. One one is a satellite that goes up to Alaska. And there's, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but not much. And in, uh, in terms of centralization and telecommunications infrastructure, there are two buildings in Seattle. One is the Bell Building um, with the big Bell logo on it. And AT&T, or no, Quest runs that, um, which is a baby Bell. AT&T's network runs out of there. Everybody else, and I mean everybody else, every other long distance company, every internet network, because there are multiples that run you know, on the same physical piece of fiber, mind you, into the Seattle area. All of that's in a building called the Weston Building. It's next to the Weston Hotel in downtown Seattle. So you know, you want to talk about centralization, yeah. you know, and telecommunications infrastructure is, is not the shining example of decentralization. You may have well, multiple routes, Across you know multiple mm -hmm. network providers that are all physically sitting in the same piece of fiber. Okay. This is not new. But, this is not new. This yeah. is the way it's been. This is not a new thing. This is basically ever since fiber went in, fiber has high enough capacity. There's no economics to put in more than one ch one chunk of one chunk of fiber. Of course, has more than one fiber in it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, one so company lights up one strand, another company lights up another one. There's just no point in putting in two because you already have 100 percent excess capacity. Yeah. Um, I, I run into this. That that's very interesting. Um, and uh, I would it's I would in the Midwest. By, oh, by yeah. the way, than it is here because the majority, like if you go to Oklahoma, <laughs> almost all the fiber running through that state runs in old, disused, former natural gas pipeline owned by the Williams Corporation. Yeah. It's it's above ground and it's completely vulnerable to to any idiot with a, a tractor in the wrong place. <laughs> Drop a bomb here, the, we can put a sticker on it. The back hole problem. It's buried and, uh, you know, so so if you walk up next to, on the rails to trails, you know, and, 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 and the mountains, then you, you've got these uh, big manhole covers with the bell logo on it. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to find our fiber here. <laughs> well, the argument, uh, to argue a little bit on the other side, it is in fact the case, yeah, even if you do take out any of those fiber rats, you, you don't take down the entire system for the most part. You take, take out, out the West, Western building, you oh, take out well, everything. Well, no, you lose Seattle, yeah. but Chicago, no, lose LA, Seattle, York, and Alaska, and Portland, uh, and anything east that runs through here, and not, not only that, all the international routes to the far east that run through here. So That's actually true, but 
again, you jump off you, to get to the Far East, you then have to go out of LA or, or bounce through um, Australia. I mean, there, there are other ways. There are other routes. Um, and there's also the other the other way around the world route. Um, you basically well, yeah, the you other way have to route through Telhouse. I, I mean, basically, but the, the, so the issue is, is that, yes, there are redundancies in that system. The, the, so the internet actually probably is a relatively good example. A, the, the fiber infrastructure of the internet is probably a relatively good example of a redundant system. There are multiple ASs. Even if you took out one of the major ASs, there's enough peering. Um, uh, so sort of in the core of the internet, you'd still do OK. I think most people's perception is that it's far more robust than it really is. Well, that, yes. that, that's my point. That's probably true, but it's not but as most, what, but it's still pretty good. Hopefully the tariffs are in that group. What's that? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, the, the, um, so there's an example if you decentralize, no one's responsible for making sure those redundancies are put in place. Yeah. Whereas in the old Bell lab yeah. system, yeah. someone would be looking at that saying, we're vulnerable, we should like plan to put in something. That, well, they that, would do that. 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 But now no Bell one's Lab. responsible. Yeah. That's partly Bell Labs, it's also partly the regulatory stuff. This is why I asked about the externalization of faults. It's because partly it was, there was an enormous amount of work on reliability and diversity. Even in the old mechanical switches, you know, there there is a massive amount of redundancy, which is one of the reasons they cost a fortune. But there was also a regulatory requirement for five nines. Uh -huh. And I'm not saying either I think both of these are good things. And what we have in the modern day strikes me as the worst of both worlds. We have no analysis of reliability, and we have a place where all of the faults can be externalized. Okay. All the cost is externalized. I mean I'm, so I'm half, I'm half with you and half against you. Yeah. Not, yeah. You understand what I mean? Yeah, this, uh, uh, and uh, to come back to your point, it, um, which I'm quite interested in because uh, I read a, a kind of a crappy uh, thriller novel by Richard Clark, um, and it's called, uh, uh, it's one word um, title, and it's, it takes place 10 years in the future. And part of it deals with blowing up the internet. Uh, destroying it and how easy it would uh, be and he talks about the Seattle Weston and uh, those examples and uh, but I'm more struck by the fact that a uh, tree limb uh, or a, no it was, turns out to be a, it was a squirrel in this case the squirrel uh, because uh, the the limbs were close enough to the wires um, um, had easy access to um, transmission of uh, electrical power and uh, cut off California for many, many hours because all the, the electricity that California uses comes from you folks up here in the north and comes down and across. All of it. There's two fibers. There's well. an AC and an AC high voltage transmission lines. They're two separate routes. <laughs> 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 what is this place? <laughs> he hasn't been polluted in a while. I'm talking about the water resources major, so I've got quite a, quite a bit of background on the okay. power but, but the you, point is... You, now, you could do that to the Oregon coast or to the Washington coast, because there's only one high-voltage transmission line out to either place. Okay, yeah. And, and it did happen to California. And it did yeah. happen yeah. in California, but it wasn't, it wasn't because of like lack of redundancy. It was because of like crappy relays. Oh yeah, well, was it like the the big black, the last big East Coast blackout was because a tree fell in a line between Akron and Toledo. Yeah, because Lake Erie Loop is an example of insane design. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's I don't know if you know much about transmission theory, but it's almost exactly a half wave around the loop. The word for this is completely unstable. Uh, it literally, I mean, technically speaking, it's just flat out insane. But, sorry, and, you don't need that. And a software that. failure was involved in that, too. Which well, was, yes. Uh, we had a recent, well, a few months ago, there was a Microsoft research lecture um, named Dr. Dr. Kathy Kramer, and she talked about asset based thinking. And one of the things that I, I see as a common thread in what you're presenting, some of the other lectures that were mentioned and part of her communications is looking at even some of the biggest, the biggest, biggest issues as assets. And I see tremendous commonality in um, a number of organizations that I'm a part of who are talking about the importance of small actions 
and small collaborations. For example, I'm a member of my local organic farm cooperative where we talk about the importance of supporting local small farms. But I am going to get to a question. I wanted to uh, point out that I'm interested in your views of the biggest opportunities for us to link together those biggest assets, the internet, become networks of small firms, um, models of looking at terrorist networks. And I, I wonder about examples such as, as citizens. I was just looking at the voting records from our local recent election, and most men in the households where in married households, most of the men did not vote. And we had a critical election issue that didn't pass by 165 votes. And so I wanted to say we are the government. And now with, with technologies like CapWiz, we can vote. And we can, part of it, yes. we can actually take action. We are the government. We are regulation. So I see an opportunity from an environmental standpoint and a security standpoint and a regulation standpoint of linking those those smaller organizations together, but I wonder where do you see the biggest opportunities? Uh, no, I, I agree with you. The opportunity is there. Uh, as the biggest opportunity, um, um, that's hard, hard to say since they're so interdependent, intertwined. Uh, and um, I Uh, I'm not optimistic, and I, I don't know where, where you would move. Uh, I think global warming is for real, and the, although we as a society could, without enormous cost, do a lot of get, uh, about it, we could just make all kinds of changes, uh, inconvenient uh, uh, changes to reach that, uh, realize that inconvenient truth. Uh, and, but we're we're not likely to because, as I ended my talk saying, with the um, um, concern for self-interest rather than community is just being overrided, overridden by prosperity, by affluence. I mean, it just sugar tastes good, butter tastes good, and we have not learned to cut back on uh, uh, all our uh, uh, consumerism. Uh, in our society. So I'm uh, fairly uh, pessimistic. I feel f fear for my grandchild, uh, what she's going to um, uh, experience. So um, I'm, I'm glad to hear what you say, but I, um, there's not much I can uh, do about it. And as John mentioned, I've been interested in this a long time. I did a book on the origins of capitalism in the 19th century, and it's the same topic. It's the same problem, but it was just much less severe uh, in, in terms of the, the whole national system um, at, uh, at that time. We were not as interdependent then, but now we are really interdependent, whether it's fiber optics or uh, uh, electric uh, power grids. I saw another... Yes? Um, yeah, I'd like to continue on the fact of trying to see myself as an asset uh, rather than the other the other side. Um, well, I see two areas, for example, where Microsoft could do things or, uh, as an asset. The first is you talk about decentralization or reducing the amount of population in the same place. How about telecommute and you know decentralizing a company geographically but still having people working remotely together as and going on the reciprocity, this is actually good for the company because it's our product and it might be good also for um, reducing the, the risk of the target. The second area is I think there is a project also around disaster relief coordination with Rayo's team um, to help all those agencies to coordinate themselves in response to a disaster. Do you have any thought about one of these two things? Uh, the the um, uh, second one, coordination, uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of very practical, well-known things that could be done. They're hard to do, but you've got to get the people talking to each other. You've got to shove the authority down to the, as far as you can to the local level. 
Um, we've, uh, there are instances of uh, disaster relief uh, in the United States that are sterling examples of coordination and other ones where they're, where they're not. Um, the disaster is a disaster. Uh, and the, the, the compelling themes that run through it is prior training, prior knowledge, acquaintanceships with uh, uh, one another, um, um, sharing information, all expensive but mundane practical things. We know how to do that. And, and we know that uh, uh, why broken systems are broken uh, in uh, that area. Um, the, f the first point you made was to remind me just quickly, what was it? Oh, yeah, telecommute. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, I, I used to think that was nifty. I still think it's nifty and for uh, the personal reasons of the people. They don't have to move that much and so forth. Uh, but um, I have a, a lingering, I'm, I'm a Luddite in this sense, uh, a lingering view that interface, interpersonal, face-to-face -face contact is still essential for us as human beings, part of our hard wiring uh, in there, so that we uh, get to understand the nuance, we get the feeling whether we can trust somebody, who we can trust for this situation, and who we, but not for this situation and somebody else. That kind of tacit knowledge that emerges from hanging out of the coffee pot uh, or going to the dance or uh, the picnic or uh, sitting in uh, sessions like this, I think uh, is, um, uh, has an irreducible value that uh, you're going to lose. And I would point out that some of the worst organizations in the world are of, of this type. I mean, Walmart is just so um, uh, tightly linked and, and, and dispersed and uh, uh, but uh, it's, the authority system there is extremely tight. There's very little flexibility allowed to any store operator. Um, the store operator can say, well, that's, this is not really our clientele. The answer is make them your clientele. They don't really like this kind of stuff. Make them like that stuff. We're going to put it up there. Um, and we're just going to have so much advertising so far. Now, that's a... It's not a networked organization, in my sense, of independent units. That's a centralized organization. Are you going to shut me off? Well, I, I was going to say, so our, uh, our telecast is going to shut off in about two minutes, and so I wanted to uh, officially uh, close this down and thank people. However, knowing that this would be a controversial uh, talk with, with a bunch of interesting subtopics to continue, we've, uh, yeah. we've got our first uh, ever uh, visiting lecture series, Talk After the Talk. We've got this room for the next hour. There's uh, coffee oh, and cookies over there. So uh, we'll be able to, uh, to continue this in, in a continuing in a formal or informal fashion. Um, still so that the people on ResNet uh, can see, just wanted to say uh, thanks for a, a very stimulating talk. As you say, uh, as you probably noticed, not, uh, none of us are here agreed with everything you said, yeah. but, uh, but I think um, I, I really participate the, uh, uh, appreciate the participation from the audience. I think these are, these are great discussions about uh, difficult issues. Um, and uh, let's continue. I, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you.